All right, this morning I'm preaching about trials and tribulations. Trials and tribulations. So the part of the chapter I'm uh, sort of bouncing off in 2 Timothy 3 is from verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience. This is his character. Not only did they know that, not only did they know what Paul was like, but verse 11, the persecutions, the afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And we're going to look at what happened in Lystra a bit later on. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yea, look at this, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now we all have difficulties in our lives. Sometimes when we think of trials and tribulation and going through hard times, um, you know, we think about the health challenges, the financial challenges, relationship challenges, and uh, there's different reasons why those things happen. But when we talk about trials and tribulations and persecutions and afflictions, usually it's things that are happening from other people for doing right. You know, because oftentimes the challenges in our life are are sometimes just caused by our own actions, you know what I mean? Like whether we're being irresponsible, we're not taking care of things or whatnot, or we're being proud, and sometimes that causes conflict in, in relationships. But today I'm talking about trials and tribulations because, you know, not everyone who's a Christian will necessarily go through trials and tribulations from the world, from the enemies of God, going through hard times in, in the sense of that. Why? Because the Bible says in verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Because you know what? If you're a Christian that's not really living for God, not really striving for godliness, not really doing something with the world and, and causing a bit of a stir, you probably won't have much trial and tribulation or persecution and mocking in your life. But we see here Paul trying to serve God and do things for God and the sort of persecutions that he endures. So, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So not everyone will suffer this type of tribulation and persecution for doing what is right. It doesn't always mean that everyone that is suffering persecution is doing the will of God. Right? So one doesn't equate to the other. But if you live godly in Christ Jesus, Paul says here, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution. So if you're trying to do what's right, if you're trying to take a stand in your life, you often will clash with other people. People might ridicule you. People might persecute you. People might outcast you. And we will experience that from differing degrees depending on you know, the sort of people you associate with and how you're living and what you're doing for God. And, and looking into you know, how our country is going and where all this vaccine stuff is going and you have to wear masks and you have to be vaccinated if you're going to work. I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the future. You may have to take a stand and suffer some persecution in even that aspect when it comes to your health, but even more so when it comes to spiritual things. We don't, we don't uh, in Australia, suffer from a lot of spiritual p persecution, right? Not yet. We don't know how the world is going, right? We already see like people like Israel Folau, for example, you know, where he just shares a paraphrase of a Bible verse on his Twitter and he almost lost his job. So these sort of days are coming and we want to know, we want to be prepared for it spiritually, mentally, and get encouragement from the Bible when they went through trials and tribulations. So we're going to look at four different people in the Bible and also another chapter, which we'll see some examples of trials and tribulations in the Bible. Now, where are we going to start? We're going to start at Job. Job in the Bible is the epitome of going through trials and tribulations caused by Satan himself. So we're going to look at these first. Job 1, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath, is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So I don't want to go through the story in too depth, but we know that Job starts off as a conversation. Between, you know, God has got his, his uh, angels coming before him. Satan is there also, right? And he talks to Satan and, and he, they talk about Job. So God gives Satan the permission to go and try Job, go and tempt him. Uh, and what does he do first? Verse 13. There was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating. So 
Uh, what I just want to point out in this verse, you see here that when he first allows Satan to go tempt Job, he says, all right, you can, all that he owns and all that he has is in, you're able to touch. But he's just saying, but you're not allowed to touch Job himself. That's the first uh, thing that he allows Satan to do. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elders, eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans, the Sabaeans is like, a, like it's like a people from another uh, nation, fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell this. This is a kind of like an invasion from a foreign people, and they've come and like kind of robbed him and uh, killed all the servants as well, except this one that escaped while he was yet speaking. So he's come, he's sharing this news and explaining to Job what's going on. There came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and it burned up the sheep. And I always like to point out here, you see how the servant thought that this supernatural event came from God. But who did it actually come from? It came from Satan. Right? So sometimes natural disasters can happen in our life. Right? And we blame God. But these are trials and tribulations that are happening in our life. Even health challenges. So, so like I said in the beginning, sometimes it's caused through ourselves. Sometimes it's actually caused by external forces, right? So trials and tribulations also can include, you know, external forces affecting your life both financially and health as well. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only have escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness. It's like thinking about like a hurricane or a strong wind. A tornado smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. I think we need to reflect on Job oftentimes when we go through hard times and try to respond the way Job did, that he didn't know everything that was happening, but he trusted the Lord, but he, but he, he also said he didn't have everything. Everything he had was from the Lord, so he's not going to curse the Lord. He said, whether he has or whether he hasn't, he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. I mean, oftentimes when I go out soul winning and I, I come across people that are bitter against God, I mean, they've lost loved ones. They've had trials in their life and they say, how can God allow this to happen to me? I don't understand. And, um, you know, even people with a Christian background. And you think, surely you know the story of Job. Surely you know that God has sometimes allowed these things to mold and to build us. And Job, that's why Job is in the Bible, right? It's one of the reasons why he's here. It's like, it's like people that have the attitude that, yeah, I can chase riches. I can, chase, well, I can handle it. That's why Solomon's in the Bible. Right? Solomon's in there to show you some, you can't handle it sometimes. You know, like he's going away and just indulging in all that stuff. And also, he realized at the end of his life, what was the point of it all? You know, that's not what your life should be about. Chasing wealth, chasing riches, chasing the things of this world. Yeah, is there anything wrong with those things? No, but your highest purpose, what do you say? Fear God, keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. So you see how like there are people in the Bible that you know are for these situations. And oftentimes you need to re remind yourself when you're going through hard times. Of course, Job is in the Bible. God has a plan. God has molding he's want to do in my life. Not forget. So here we see Job losing everything. All his possessions, all the loved ones in his life, all his children. Right? Job too. It doesn't stop there. So this is where. Job responded well, and now Satan is saying, yeah, but if you touch him, right, then he'll curse you, right? And the Lord said unto Satan, behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So he's saying, you can do whatever you want to him, but you can't kill him. Verse 7, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot 
unto his crown. Oh man, like I suffer from eczema. Like sometimes I've had like really bad rashes where you know, your sores are weeping and everything. I just think, I'm sure, I mean, it's not as bad as this, but you get a bit of a taste. I got a bit of a taste. It was just like some sore like just everywhere. You just got sores. It's terrible. And he took him a pot shirt to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Uh, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. So it's like Job is at his lowest point. He has lost everything, lost his children, all his possessions, and now, not even that, now his wife has turned on him. Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. This is why it's so important, guys, that we love one another, we support one another, because sometimes when everything else is gone, you can at least have one another. You can at least have your wife, your family, you know, your, your friends, but if you turn on one another, man, this is like, you know, it, it's almost like, you know, this was worse, because, I mean, think about it. What, what, what happened first? He lost all his possessions. He lost, like, some people dear to him, but then somebody that was meant to sort of help him be a backbone and help him here, even now he's lost that, right, after he's lost his help. And he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. And we don't know, and I'm sure Job, being a righteous man, would have said this in, in, a, in a right way, but basically he's telling his wife that she's saying foolish things. What shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil in all this? Did not Job sin with his lips? Man, hopefully when we go through trials and tribulations, we have Job's response. That even though we go through all this, we won't speak as foolish people. We will say, hey, we came in naked, we'll go naked, and in all this, we won't sin with our lips. So that's Job's example, a story that's very familiar to us. What's another? Some of these stories will be very familiar to you, but I'm going to look at Elijah. Elijah, one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. A lot of people believe he's going to be one of the two witnesses in the end times. You know, the two witnesses that come and people are going to try and attack them and fire will come out of their mouth and all sorts of stuff. And eventually they'll kill them both and you know, they'll be rejoicing and sending gifts one to another. So a lot of people believe it's Elijah and Moses because a lot of the curses and things that they do on the people are very similar to the things Elijah and Moses did with the plagues and with the fire coming down from heaven. But Elijah, if you know his story, one of the great things that happened in 1 Kings 18, and I'll just, uh, just summarize it because I'm going to start at uh, chapter 19. But remember, you know, when he challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, right? And he went up to Mount Carmel, and this was King Ahab, and Ahab was married to Jezebel, and that was in, in the encounter. And he said, like, hey, you slice up a, a bull and offer to your God, and then I'll do the same. And whichever God responds by fire, he's the true God. So what did the prophets of Baal do? They, they, they prayed their bullock, and from day till night, they're cutting themselves. And then what does uh, Elijah start doing? He starts mocking them. He starts saying, maybe you've got to cry louder, because he's asleep, or maybe he's in a journey. can't hear you, because he's not like the true God. But then what does Elijah do? Elijah prepares his altar of 12 stones. Not only that, he, did you know he pours water all over it? So there's like no chance that there's like, you know, some trick there, some spark there pours water all over it three times, you know, and then he calls out to God, and what happens? The fire comes down. It doesn't only consume the offering, but it, like, evaporates all the water as well, <laughs> right? So great victories, doing great things for God. You'd think, like, this man's going to be on top of the world, right? But nobody is immune to highs and lows, right? First Kings 19, this happens after this great victory. And after this victory, all he get, kills all the prophets of Baal. People are starting to now recognize that the Lord God is the true God. But what happens? Who's not happy? Jezebel. Jezebel, Ahab's wife's not happy. Right? And now she's after Elijah. She's trying to kill him. Verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all, how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto, unto Elijah, saying... So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. Because remember, he slain, slew all the prophets. So Jezebel was saying, like, well, God do that to me. And, and one day God does do this to her, right? But so she basically is saying to Elijah, I'm out to kill you. 
And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. So now he's fleeing for his life, right? Because she's basically running the, 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 the nation, right? Because if you know the story of Ahab and Jezebel, she's a bit of a manipulator and basically pulling the strings. Um, and he's, uh, Ahab's a bit of a weak king when you sort of read about some of the things he did. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. See, what ought to encourage you here with Elijah is, you know, oftentimes people get down and unfortunately, you know, they shouldn't, but they do. They start having suicidal thoughts. Maybe it's better I'm not here. Nobody needs me or, you know, this is too hard. I'm going to end it all. And, you know, they think, you know, nobody's ever experienced this. You know, but did you know that Elijah has had suicidal thoughts? Do you know it's possible for people who do great things as much as call down fire from God in heaven and have 400 prophets of Baal slaughtered, a great victory, turn a nation back to the Lord, and yet here he is in a depressed state, feeling he wants, to be, he wants God to take away his life. He wants to die. So, you know, like Job reminds us of how we should respond, sometimes Elijah should remind us like, Hey, the greatest of men have gone through this too, but the Lord will get us through it. The Lord can get us through these things. Right? If, if Elijah can have downs like this, surely those of us, and, and very few of us, as great as Elijah, surely we can expect these sorts of things too to happen in people's lives. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, so he's out in the wilderness, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. So sometimes when things are a bit overwhelming and you're feeling these thoughts, sometimes you just need to take some time away and just relax, make sure you're taking care of your diet, eating, do you know? And here God knows this. He just like lets him rest, actually supernaturally brings him food in the wilderness. And he looked and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. So notice that God doesn't come to him and go, why are you like this? You know, pick yourself up, buddy. Like, you're better than this kind of thing. Right? So you can see God's attitude here. Is just, he just comes to him and just feeds him, just like takes care of him. Just give him some time. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. So that's all I wanted to mention about Elijah there, to show, look, he did great things for God, and the sort of trial and tribulation that he suffered is actually somebody trying to kill him. It's out for him, right? And he's on the run. You know, when you think of David as well, we saw the same thing, right? These are the sort of trials and tribulations that people in the Bible have gone through. And uh, you, know, you can see here, obviously, that Elijah got to the point where he didn't even want to live anymore, but... You know, obviously God still had a plan for him. He did great things after that. And after that, he meets Elisha, right? And, and, and Elisha did great things too. That was so his right-hand man. So that's two Old Testament examples. Let, let's look at two New Testament examples. Two New Testament examples. This is uh, some of the trials and tribulations that Peter went through. And if you read them, some of them are a little bit, a little bit comical, actually, when you read them. I'm sure going through it at the time, you know, is, uh, it was terrible. And I think we can't even imagine the sort of persecution and tribulation and trials that the apostles went through. You know, and our trials and tribulations pale in comparison to this. But when you read through, if you're not familiar with these stories, some of them are a little bit humorous. In Acts 5, just the jailbreaks that happened in Acts. If you've never read through Acts, you've got to read through these things. Read through them and read the stories. They're, they're very interesting. They've got a lot of doctrine in them, obviously, and a lot of encouragement. Acts 5, verse 17. So, you know, the, the apostles are preaching, right, doing, you know, healing people, things like that, doing all these great things for God. And obviously the establishment there, the religious establishment, is not happy. Then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. I mean, how often have we done something that has risked us going to jail? Not many of us, right? I mean, generally when we think of trials and tribulations, it's like somebody making fun of us at work 
or like maybe somebody doesn't want to be your friend anymore because you're too holy or something like that, right? So um, oftentimes that, they're, they're the sort of things that Christians complain about, but obviously there are a lot more serious things that happen in our life too. So they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. So you see how they've already been preaching, now they're put into prison, and now miraculously they're let out of this prison. So when they heard that, then they're told, Go keep and preaching to the people. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. So now it's the next day, they're saying, okay, we're going to go talk to the people we put in jail and go get them from the prison. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told. So they're like saying, they're not there anymore, saying the prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. So you see how they go back to the prison. They say, oh, it's all locked up and the keepers are there, but the prisoners are no longer in there. Verse 24, Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them, whereunto this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So isn't that, isn't that funny that they put these guys into prison and then they try and get them the next day. They're trying to figure out, like, where did these guys go? And then they receive a message. Like, you know the guys that you threw into prison? Well, they're back in the temple and they're preaching the word of God. So just, uh, I just like love the, the boldness here. You know, oftentimes when we get hit once with a hammer, you know, by, by, the, by the arm of authority, we're kind of like twice shy. But, you know, thank God we have the, the example of the apostles here. And granted, you know, they had some supernatural help here, but this boldness that they had that even though they went through these trials and tribulations, did that stop them? But they didn't even hesitate, right? They were told to go back and preach to the people, and the next day, there they are, even the day before they, they were put into prison. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. So it's great that how you can see these people in the Bible going through these hard times, you can get some lessons, some encouragement, how they respond, how Job responds, how Elijah responded, how Peter is responding to doing what is right, knowing that and having the boldness to do what's right by God rather than by men. We'll skip down. So this is verse 33. So he does a bit of preaching there, verse 33. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. So now, not only do they want to just jail them and take away their liberty, now they're actually out to take their life. This is the sort of trials and tribulation these people are going through, risking their life to do this. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. So he's saying, look, 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 let's not kill them, let's just you know, put them back, you know, or just give them some space, right? Verse 35, why? He said unto them, you men of Israel, take heed to yourselves. What ye intend to do is touching these men. For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who were slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. So he's saying eventually there was another guy that kind of built up a cult following, and then, you know, eventually the 400, they just, he just died out, Right? After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. So he's saying, hey, there's these two sort of cultic personalities that grew up, and it's like, hey, no. So they're trying to liken Jesus to this and liken to the apostles to these people. But he says here, but now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel of this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. 
most happily ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So what I just want you to note here is, oftentimes people will take this passage as though it's the word of God. So you've got to be careful in the Bible, because in the Bible you have statements which are from the author of the book, right? That's the Holy Spirit writing these words or saying these words through the apostles and through the people that have penned them down and they've used to speak them. But then you have stories in the Bible of people saying things. Now, when you have a story in the Bible of somebody saying things, you have to discern, is what this person's saying actually true or false? Right? We can't just say, well, the Bible has somebody saying this. It sounds good. This is, therefore, this is how God works. Because this is not how God works. Right? Because he says, because what he's saying is, if this is just a movement of man, then eventually it's going to come to naught. Right? But that's not always the case. Because you have a lot of old religions that are false but still persist right i mean is buddhism is of man islam is of man you know the the mormons is of man but they're still around right sometimes they're around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years right not just in their lifetime which is what he's comparing them to he's like saying remember this guy kind of rose up a couple of years later fizzled out so you see here just because something lasts doesn't mean it's of god but what he's saying here, but is it if of, is of God, you won't be able to fight it. That is true, right? That is true that if it is of God, no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to overthrow it, right? So yeah, the true religion will always be around, but just the ones that are always around doesn't mean they're of God, right? Just because they're around and they haven't sort of stamped out yet. I mean, yeah, sure, eventually they will, right? When Jesus comes back, but like just because people will just sort of say these things sometimes to justify their own false religion, right? The, the cults will do that. But like I said, this is just something that Gamaliel is saying. This is not a truth in and of itself. But they agree with him. They say, okay, sure. Right? And after they, you know, they call the apostles, now don't miss this, and beaten them. Right? So it's not just like, okay, guys, just go away. It's like they call them. Who knows what this beating is like, but I'm sure it wasn't pleasant. You know what I mean? Be, I mean, I've never been beaten up, thank God. But I can, I can assure you, it's probably not very pleasant, like people punching you and kicking you on the floor and going away on it with broken bones and all that sort of stuff. I'm sure they didn't do it lightly. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. But look at the response from the apostles. And they departed from the presence of the council. Look at this. Rejoicing. Man, this is like amazes me that they respond this way. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. See, when, when you do what's right, and you, like Peter says, you suffer as a Christian. You know, now when you read his epistles and he talks about this, it gives you a bit more insight that he knows what he's talking about, right? So he's not just like saying it and he can't empathize with people truly suffering for doing what's right. I mean, he's been beaten and prison and all this, and yet he says, hey, we count it worthy that I'm able to go through this for the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, may God help us to have that sort of mindset when we go through trials and tribulations for his name. And daily, look at this, daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. You see, when times get hard, they didn't quit. They didn't quit on God when things got tough. They kept going. They counted it worthy that they were able to suffer. And they rejoiced to be able to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. But what do we do? Sometimes we go through hard times. Ah, oh, that's it. It's too hard. And sometimes we go soul winning. <clears throat> we run into somebody we know. I can't do that again. This is too embarrassing. Is this how the apostles reacted? And they counted, they counted, they rejoiced and counted it worthy that somebody might ridicule them for doing what was right. And they didn't quit daily in the temple. And in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So that's the first jailbreak. I'm just trying to go through the second one because this one's funny as well. So you see here, they, they get out and they're going back and preaching straight away and, you know, obviously upsetting the establishment here. Acts 12, they're doing things as well. Now it's getting a little more tough. They kill, you know, Herod the king is trying to kill some of the key apostles. Right? Acts 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands 
to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So think about what Peter's going through, right? He's be they're beaten before, jailed. Now he's got King Herod after his life. The only reason why maybe he survived is because Herod didn't want to do it during the days of unleavened bread, right? And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So Peter's basically now in prison but doing what's right and kind of like on death row, right? Because he's just waiting after Easter, which is the Passover. It's just another word for the Passover. So there's a, lot, a lot of people think this word is some, some pagan holiday. It's not Easter, it's just another word for Passover in the Bible, but it just wasn't translated as Passover in this passage. To bring him forth to the people. So imagine, can you imagine sitting in prison knowing that in you know, a week's time, you're going to be killed. I don't think any of us in this room have uh, experienced that. Verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. All right, so here what we can learn from this example here with Peter is, you know, we've got to pray for one another. You know, times can be hard, and I know conflicts can happen, but, you know, if we're not there for each other, Who's going to be there for each other? You know, maybe right now, you know, you have friends and family that are there for you. They go through tough, tough times. But sometimes I wonder, will our unsaved family and friends, will our unfaithful family and friends be there when times get tough? Hey, they're going to be the ones turning us into the government, maybe. You know, when we're like on the run and saying like, that's where they are. And you know, that person's not wearing a mask. That person's not social distancing. It's already happening, right? So this is why those of us that know the truth, that love God and know what's going to happen, you know, you have to support one another and love one another. Because you've got to, sometimes you've got to pray for one another. Right? When one of us is going through hard times, you pray for each other. Here's what's happening here. The church, without ceasing, is praying for Peter. And I'm sure at a time like this, it is justified, right? Because you've got your leader basically there waiting to be killed. You don't know what's going to happen. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. So again, another miraculous prison break. Before it was just the opening the doors. Same thing now. It's getting out of prison again. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. So this is all happening, right? Chains are falling off. And Peter's like not really sure, like, is this actually happening or am I just having a vision? Right? When they were past the first and the second war, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, so now he, so you know, obviously there's this supernatural thing happening, and, you know, whether it's like, you know, is he walking and people can't see him? I mean, we can all theorize about how all the mechanics of this jailbreak happen. But basically, he gets out of the end, and then he says, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. So notice it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the high priest that put him into jail before, wanted to kill him. Now it's the king that's put him in prison, right? So different events here. From all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Here's where it gets a bit humorous, and I just want to show you the rest of this story if you're not familiar with it. So remember... The church, without ceasing, is praying for Peter. Lord, deliver him. Lord, you're out of prison. Lord. So what does God do? God answers that prayer, right? And he actually gets him out of prison. So here he is, Peter now, at the house of Mary, the mother of John. And he's knocking on the door. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken. So she's hearing somebody knocking at the door. Her name's Rhoda. And when she heard, when she knew Peter's voice, so she recognizes that this is Peter. She opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. So she's like, oh, that's Peter's voice. I better go tell everyone. And they said unto her, look at this, thou art mad. 
What does that mean? The mad in the King James Bible is not angry. Mad is, you're crazy. You're crazy. You're crazy that here we are all praying for God to deliver Peter out of trials and tribulation. He's knocking at the door. They don't even, you show it. They don't even believe the prayer that they're asking for. That God can do it because now he's done it and they're like, you're mad. You're crazy, right? And oftentimes we pray with that attitude, don't we? You know, we pray with that attitude where we pray that God would do something about it, but we don't really believe it. You know, but God is graceful. He does it anyway sometimes. You know, it's according to his will. Our imperfect prayers still go to God and God will answer as according to his will in his perfect timing. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then they then said they, it is his angel. It's not him. It's just his angel is taking care of. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were shocked, right? So it's not. It wasn't like a praise God that God did what we had that expectation that God would deliver him. They were surprised that God actually delivered him. But thank God for that, right? We can pray imperfectly, but God is still gracious. To us, but see the sort of trial and tribulation that Peter's going through. I mean, these are not small things beatings, imprisonment, life, and death. Right? So, I'm just giving you another perspective on when the Bible says, Yea, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, let's go to the person that actually wrote these words that the Holy Ghost used to give us these words Paul the Apostle. Now, if you remember when he said all these things that came upon me at Lystra. I don't know if you know what actually happened at Lystra. So this is in Acts 14 in Lystra. It says here, and he's preaching and everything, and it says here, there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. He was stoned to death at Lystra. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas into Derby. So when Paul is saying, the things that happened to me at Lystra, and you know, yea, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about being stoned to death for preaching the gospel. That's what he's talking about. A lot of people believe he was stoned to death. I know he came back to life here. A lot of people believe it was a miracle. Why? Because in 2 Corinthians, he talks about knowing a man and he doesn't know, was caught up to the third heaven. All unspeakable things. A lot of people believe that this is Paul reflecting that he actually, you know, died here, right? And had a vision of heaven and then was brought back to life, right? So, miraculously. So he says here in verse 21, And when they preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, and to Iconium and Antioch, so you remember those word names from when we read in Corinthians, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and look at this, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. You know, I'm sure that Paul, going through what he did, gave these words a lot more oomph. Do you know what I mean? When he's saying, hey, we must go through tribulation, to enter, into the, to enter into the kingdom of God. Basically saying, we're going to go through hard times before we go to heaven. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So these are the sort of things that Paul went through. So not only was he stoned, and a lot of people believe he died at that point and came, was miraculously brought back to life. Look at some of the other things that Paul went through. So I want to, that's why we're talking about trials and tribulations this morning and I want to talk, and what I wanted to talk about was the trials and tribulations we see people in the Bible going through. 2 Corinthians 11. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, off. Of the Jews... Five times received I 40 stripes, save one. So he's probably been whipped countless times, stripes above measure. But then he recounts that there were five times where when he was whipped, he was whipped 39 times. Because probably when you're whipped, you're probably not whipped so, so much, right? 
you know, maybe it would be 10 lashes, 20 lashes, but he's saying there were five times where the Jews couldn't go over 40, right? It says less, because the Bible talks about, you know, unless your brother kind of hates you and things like that. But then he received one less than the maximum, right? Five times. If you do the math, that's 195 lashes, right? Over five sessions. Thrice, three times, was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. That's the event at Lystra. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. So it's not only in the book of Acts where there was the shipwreck, but these three times he talks. So we only know about one. Thrice I, sh I suffered shipwreck, right? So that's trying to travel to preach the gospel, and then your boat, like, is shipwreck. And he says, a night and a day I have been in the deep. He's saying, these are the sort of things I've been through to serve God. A night and a day in the deep, what does that mean? He's probably on some floating lo lonesome or whatever. And... Um, is in the ocean for a day and a night, hoping to be saved by somebody. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, by the, by the Jews and, and the Israelites, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, it's when you're tired, you can't go on. Painfulness in watchings often. It's when you can't, you can't sleep because you have to be awake to, to, to protect yourself. In hunger and thirst, not having food and water. In fastings often. In cold and nakedness, no clothing. And look what he says here in verse 28. Beside those things that, that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care, of all the churches. Man, like when I think about what Paul went through, it kind of diminishes my, uh, <laughs> my trials and tribulations just a tad. You know what I mean? Where it's like, you think you've got it hard, and then you see what Paul went through, and you wonder how anyone can believe a prosperity gospel. Right? Like, if anyone should be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and have great teeth, and a beautiful wife, and all these things, profitable, it should be Paul. But no. He says, because he served the Lord Jesus Christ, we get a list of the things that he was suffering and going through in his life. He says, not only that, not only the things that are without external forces that are affecting me, but I also have the burden of taking care of God's people, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So I'm sure this gives you a little bit of a different insight when he says here in 2 Timothy 3, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now I want to go through one more passage. We looked at two in the Old Testament, two in the New Testament. Now I want to look at just a few verses in the Hall of Faith. You know what the Hall of Faith is? The Hall of Faith is Hebrews 11, and it's known as the Hall of Faith, kind of like the Hall of Fame, because it just goes through a lot of people that have done great things through faith for God. Right? But I want to read some passages here from verse 32, because earlier on in the chapter, if you've read it, you can go back and read it another time, gives like some specific examples and goes a bit more in depth into those stories. But then at verse 32, it just talks generally about everyone else that's not mentioned, right? A lot of people that did great things for God. He says here, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak. And if you're familiar with your Bible, you'll know some of these stories. And if you're not, hey, I encourage you to read through the Bible. Read them, know them. And of Samson, right? Samson, the strong one with the long hair and of Jephthah, and David also, Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Right? So alien just means a foreigner. Right? But we use that word to describe you know, this evolutionary fairy tale of life evolving everywhere else, which is not true. So that's all the positives, right? Well, they, they, vic they were victorious. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Here's where we start getting to the negatives. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. What does that mean? If you recant, if you give in, we'll stop torturing you. And they're like, no! that they might obtain a better resurrection. 
Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. That's sort of the things we went over with the apostles and Paul. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. Are you, you realizing this? People, the kind of things that people have gone through for their faith? Sawn asunder? Cut in pieces? Crazy. Were tempted. Were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And look at this. I love this passage in verse 38. It says, Of whom the world was not worthy. Wouldn't you love that to be said about you? To say that the world wasn't even worthy to have you on this earth. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I'd love that to be said about me, but you know, I, I definitely don't do the things I think you know, uh, that would make me fit into this category. But you know, that's what these, what these people So the world is not even worthy to have these people and look at the things that they went through. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. What is it saying here? They didn't get to see Jesus Christ die on the cross, even though they put their faith in that promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Right? So that's saying it all comes together to fulfill all these things. So we looked at two in the Old Testament, two in the New Testament. I just wanted to give you a good feeling when the Bible talks about trials and tribulations, we just want our trials and tribulations to be put in perspective of how bad it can really get, how bad it has gotten in the past. And, uh, you know, we don't sort of see this in our life. So what are some applications? I just want to finish with just five quick points of just ap applications. How are we going to apply now this greater appreciation of trials and tribulations of what people have done in time past, what people have had done to them in time past? Hebrews 12. One thing is, you know, we go through hard times, guys, but sometimes it helps to know that the things that we go through are not really as bad as we think. And it can help us to cope. It can help us to realize and put it in perspective and, and go, you know, I, I just feel like this is so overwhelming and everything, but then sometimes when you put it in perspective and you put it next to a bigger thing, you're like, you know what? This is not so bad. This helps me cope. It's not, I'm not, it's not, it's not really as bad as it could be. You know, and sometimes, uh, you know, in... Uh, Sales talk, they talk about you're focusing on the dot. I don't know if you've ever heard about that, but you know, imagine you had a dot you know, on the, on the, on the um, thing, wall or whatever. And uh, the, the, the analogy goes like this, that if you're focusing on the dot, it seems big. Right? But then as you move out and you look at the bigger picture, you realize, oh, it's just a, it's just a dot. It's a small thing. So it's just talking about your perspective. Sometimes we focus too much on the dot. We don't realize how small the dot is because we're focused right on it. We see it. It's taking up our full vision. But if you take a few steps back, you look at the bigger picture, you realize sometimes the problems aren't as big as you think they are. And it, I'm not saying that these problems are not important. I'm not saying that they, they diminish them in any significance. I'm just saying that it can help you cope when you put it in perspective. Right? Hebrews 12.1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, so we just finished Hebrews 11. This goes into Hebrews 12. Lay, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You see how Paul now is trying to encourage people to not give up, right? Because people before you have gone through much worse and they didn't give up. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God uh, of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners. So whilst we consider those in the past, he's saying, also consider our blessed Lord, Jesus Christ, against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So you see how like, if you don't consider these things, if you don't put it in perspective, you can get a bit downtrodden and a bit overburdened and you can quit or you can faint in your minds. But look, verse 4, ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So the people he's writing to are saying like, these people sometimes risk their lives, were tortured. And you may get wearied in your mind. You need to remember that people have died for these things. So don't you faint, don't you quit, because you haven't gone through these things. And when we think about the people in this room, I mean, I'm sure I can apply it to everyone in this room. Man, we have not gone through these things. We have not striven unto blood, so 
I'm sure we can put these things into perspective. That we go through hard times, but really, it's not that bad in comparison to what can happen to us and what may happen to us one day. Second Corinthians 4, second application. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So this is Paul sharing the things, hey, he's gone through these hard times. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now we just read through 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul was going through the things that he went through. And look at how he describes it when he has the right perspective. He says, for our light affliction, <laughs> which is but for a moment, it's temporary, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So you see how he's, the perspective changes, makes it a bit easier to cope. You know that it's temporary, it makes you look to eternal. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Right? So even when you go through trials and tribulations, you know in comparison sometimes it's light, but sometimes it's light as well because you know it's only going to last a lifetime. But lifetime in comparison to eternity is nothing. Right? It's a blink of an eye. It's a, it's, a, it's a vapor like the Bible explains in James. That's the second thing I want you guys to think about when it comes to trials and tribulations. That it's temporary, so don't let it make you quit. 2 Corinthians 1, 3. This is also a good way to think of when you go through hard times and trials and tribulations. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth, comforteth us in all our tribulation. Look at this. So God's comforting us when we go through trials and tribulation. Why? That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. So you see how Paul there has a different perspective. Rather than just thinking, woe is me, he's thinking, you know, the more I suffer trials and tribulation, the more effective that's going to be for me to comfort somebody else through trials and tribulations. He's seeing the positive of how God is allowing him to go through this, making him a more effective support for God's people. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. So you see how he's saying, we suffer to help you, Corinthians, but you will suffer so that you can help others too, like we are suffering. Right, so when you go through trials and tribulation, it allows you to comfort others more effectively. And we'll circle back to Job. James 5. Job is mentioned here. Verse 10. Take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Jonah and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. What is he saying here when he says, Behold, we count them happy which endure? Because you read about David, you read about, you know, Job, you read about what the apostles went through, and then you see them endure and not quit and the things that they accomplish. And you think, man, isn't it great? Like you read it and you're encouraged and things like that. But you know what? If they didn't, those stories may not be there. If they didn't go through those trials, you wouldn't have them there to encourage you. So sometimes you've got to remember that there is good that comes out of going through hard times. And you don't want to just focus on the trials and tribulations. Behold, we count them happy which endure. So we're glad that they went through these things. It's not always easy for to be glad that we go through these things. But you've heard of the patience of Job, seeing the end of the law. You see how it works out in the end, right? It doesn't always work out in this life, but you see also maybe in the next life. But the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So particularly with Job. Now remember in Job, 
Job did not know what Satan and God were saying. And do you remember when Job finally you know, was pleading to God and God finally came to him? God didn't actually tell him any of the why. Just, just asked him questions like, where were you when I made the foundations of the earth? Do you know this? Do you know that? And he's like, no. So he just said, you don't know everything, so you just got to trust in the Lord. Do you, do you realize that that's all Job got? All he knows is that. All he knew was that. That, that he just had to trust God. He didn't know why, why God let him go, go through all that. Because the lesson here is that we should trust that God loves us, that, he, that he's taking care of us, and he's allowing us to go through certain things because he's molding us to be better and to be you know, more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what James 5 is referring to. Like, you know, when you look at suffering in the Bible, you need to reflect on it and realize, hey, well, God did good for them and worked things out. Surely he's doing the same for me. And it allows us to trust him and know that what we are going through has a purpose, right? And God knows what's going on. He'll provide a way to escape sometimes, like in Elijah. He may, ha- he may support at other times, but other times he knows you could overcome and therefore he's giving you something to overcome. Job 23. Last verse here. So let's look at what Job reflects on going through trials and tribulations. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. So what is Job saying here? He's saying sometimes when you're going through trials and tribulations, you think God's not around. Because you look around, you can't see him. Right? You look forward, you don't know whether he's there. You look backward, did he help me? He's working on the left, but you can't see. You don't always see the work that God's doing in the background. Right? And sometimes we sometimes question whether God is even there. Right? When you go through hard times. But what does Job respond? What does he say here in verse 10? Job 23, 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So it might not seem like he is there, but, but you've got to trust that he is. He is there because he's not a liar. And he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Right? It's like that... Uh, analogy of the footsteps in the sand. You, know, you heard that one where somebody's life is represented by footprints in the sand and, he's, and, and there's two footprints there. And, they, and then one represents his footprints and the other represents God's footprints. And he's looking at his life and he says, God, how come sometimes when I look at the footprints in the sand, you know, there's only one set of footprints. You know, where were you in those times of my life when I needed you most? And then the analogy goes, the parable goes, God says to the person, you know, my son, in those times where you see one footprint in the sand, that was when I carried you. Right? So those were actually God's footprints in the sand. He was thinking that God wasn't actually there for it. So sometimes it's like that when we go through trials and tribulations. We don't think that God is there. We start to trust that he doesn't care about us, but he does. He's there. And we often should be reminded that he does love us, He's allowing us to go through these things for a reason. And you need to consider the end of Job, right? That he came forth as gold. He was improved by it, right? And when we go through trials and tribulations, and they are nowhere even near what people in the Bible have gone through, you know, we still need to have a good, right perspective that we will come forth as gold. We will be better from it. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for... uh, the examples from the Bible about just people suffering. And Lord, help us to put things in perspective. Help us not to be discouraged, Lord, and quit. Help us to know that through this, you're building us and molding us to be in a more effective comforter for others. And Lord, uh, may we trust that you love us, that you're there for us, that you help us. And uh, Lord, may we trust that you are refining us and uh, making us like gold. So we thank you, Lord, for your love. We know that you care for us. You know that we know that you don't want us to just be spoiled children. You know, we know that you want us to grow in faith and in truth and in grace. So we thank you, Lord, for loving us in this way. Help us to see and have the right perspective on trials and tribulations and give us grace, Lord, so that we may overcome and uh, 
power through it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.